To the finder of this note, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for all the pain I caused you. All of you. I never meant for things to be this way. All I wanted was to smile and laugh and be happy like you. To wake up every day and look at the birds and the trees and the sun and feel the warmth I've heard so many stories about. To look in the mirror and see my reflection and to look at it like someone I could trust. I wanted to walk out the door and be greeted by the bright faces of ponies who cared about me and I cared about too. Maybe I could brighten up their day just a little, if only for a second, with a hug or a kind word or a muffin. Maybe if they felt sad, I could cheer them up and maybe they would do the same for me. And finally, I always wanted to fall asleep every night with the hope that things might just be better tomorrow. But I hurt you. And for that, I, I couldn't get what I wanted. I didn't deserve it. My existence didn't bring you happiness. Only anger and pain. I tried to give you the love that I had, but every time I tried to make you happy, I always messed up. I tried my very, 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 very best, but no matter how hard I tried, I only made things worse for you. You hated me, and I understand why. I hated me too. If you've taught me anything, it's that being different is just too hard. And that's why you don't want ponies like me. How can we all live in harmony if there are ponies like me around? Some pony could get hurt. That's why we all have to be the same. You could never trust me, so neither did I. Some pony like me has no place, you said. I made you sick, you said. Just go away, you said. So I did. And you replaced me. And nothing that really mattered was lost. Everyone would like it better this way. No one will be sad or angry because of me. Now that I'm gone, you can all finally be happy. I won't mess anything up ever again. Every pony will be the same. No pony else will cry again. Not even me. I've cried enough. You can wake up surrounded by ponies you love, too. Every day I woke up alone. I would walk up to the mirror and see a pony who's caused nothing but hurt. Those eyes reminded me of everything I'd done. They would fill with tears until I didn't have any more left. I just wanted to close them forever. I'd walk outside, and no matter what I do, ponies wanted me gone. At the end of the day, I'd cry myself to sleep with nothing but regrets. Maybe I won't get to see daylight shining in my window again. Maybe I won't ever get to feel the warmth of a friend's hooves comforting me, telling me it's going to be okay. Maybe I'll never be able to do the same for some pony else. But if me being gone makes you happy, then that's what I'll do. Because really, it'll make me happy too. Goodbye. I love you. Derpy hooves. You could not believe it. You dashed the note away with a frantic wave of your hoof. For a moment, all you could do was simply sit, petrified, and allow the shock to set in. You've been asked by Rainbow Dash to bring Derpy to Sugar Cube Corner to attend the birthday surprise she and her friends had planned. Every pony who was any pony was going to be there. The decorations, the catering, the ambience, everything was lavishly planned on a grand scale. No expense spared, and all for the shy little male mare. Fluttershy mentioned at some point or another that she'd noticed Derpy being especially monolically so naturally Pinkie Pie wouldn't rest until they'd show some grand gesture of kindness to her. There was more than that though, and you knew it. Not every pony said it, but her adorable, clumsy mannerisms, her warm, gentle personality, and her uniquely adorable smiling face always found a way to turn even the darkest, blackest of nights into a cozy, friendly evening. 
every pony had always loved her, but never got the opportunity to show it. Either they were too shy, or Derpy was too shy to reciprocate it. The wind slammed the front door to Derpy's house home behind you, jolting you back into consciousness, frantically, as if the entire structure were engulfed in flames and crashing down around you. You dashed about and searched for her, from the threshold of the door where you found the note, up through every room you could think of. You ripped the place apart for her. You turned over furniture. You looked in closets, all while shouting her name on permanent repeat. Derpy! You cried violently. Derpy, where are you? <gasps> you cried again. This time, your voice cracked as your eyes filled with tears. You nearly collapsed to the floor under the weight of your distress, faltering slightly in your step as you continued your search. <gasps> Derpy! Please be okay! Please! You sobbed softly, sorrow overtaking your capacity to yell. Rushing upstairs and through a long, cavernous corridor of a hallway, you arrived at the door to Derpy's bedroom, the final room to search. As you reached hurriedly to open it, you heard a horrible, thunderish crashing sound. Wood hit against wood, followed by a great muffled thump. Derpy! You yelled hysterically at the absolute top of your lungs. You didn't even care if anyone heard you. All you cared about was that Derpy was alive and safe, heart pounding, breath racing. You pushed against the door with all your might. Not a budge. The lock was sealed tight. You pushed again, fueled by sheer, unrelenting determination. Still nothing. Your resolve would not waver. Backing up several feet, you braced yourself to completely demolish the door. Taking a large breath, holding it in, you rushed at the large locked wooden door like some enraged bull. The door stood firm, and the resulting shock dashed you against the ground like a mutilated ragdoll. Adrenaline, however, made you impervious to the pain, and if anything, it augmented your drive even more intensely than it already had. You backed up several more feet this time, to the point where you almost touched the opposite end of the hallway. No force in the world could keep you from her now. You steadied your feet, lowered your head, closed your eyes, and ran. Ran like you never ran before in your entire life. You ran faster than you would than if you were running for your own life. The door gave way, splintering with impact and sending you flying bullet-like into the room. It took you a moment to collect yourself, to make the world beneath your feet stop spinning wildly and for your eyes to make out anything other than brilliant splashes of colors. Colors, though, eventually gave way to silhouettes and then still to the world. The room was bleakly, unnervingly dark. The blinds draping the windows let in only the faintest slivers of life, sporadically casting thin white blades over the walls. Scattered evanescent bits of dust added dimension to the light before receding into the darkness once more. As your eyes adjust, the first thing you are able to see is Derpy, lying motionless on the floor across the room. It soon became the only thing you could see, the only thing that mattered, nearly tripping over what remained of the door, then again over a frail, fallen wooden chair obscured by the darkness you rushed to Derpy's side, placing a hoof at the arch of her back, and another at the base of her neck. You cradle her limp form in your embrace. Her eyes and her mouth were closed, not a muscle stirred, and her thin, delicate frame brought to mind holding a little bird. Derby, you whisper as the tears drip and cascades down your face. The world seemed so slow now, compressed to the shape size of a single pony, and it was an empty world. A world without bright lights and warm smile of a pony who never thought ill of anyone. That is what you saw, looking on like Luna from the moon in her infinite solitude. You can no longer endure it. You collapsed, <laughs> placing your head on Derby's chest and dolorously sobbing uncontrollably. Moments became eternities as a million thoughts darted in and out of your mind at a breakneck speed, 
what you should have done differently. What you'd do if you've only had one more day with her. Apologizing for any wrongdoing you might have done to her. But all the thoughts were transcendent in your sadness, and all melted together into static. You felt a strange sensation as you pressed against Derby's body. You paused, pulling her closer to pinpoint its origin. Her chest moved faintly up and down in a slow dirge of a rhythm. You pulled back, jolting into a kneeling position, still holding her in your forelimbs. Your eyes widened as impulsively, almost instinctively, you tried calling to her, urging her to wake with your hoofs and words. <laughs> You cried, the magnitude of the world flooding back to you, wanting nothing more than for her to experience its majesty even for a moment. For a second, there was silence. As her chest moved inward and outward in full, complete breaths, her eyelids parted and the smallest fraction visible, if only barely so, in the darkness of the room. Jubilantly, you threw your forelegs around her shoulders into an embrace. Her eyes jolted open, taking a moment to register the universe she found herself in. Dumbstruck, she looked around the room and then to you. What? what's going on? She calmly, sincerely asked. You almost left us, Derby. You replied, your voice quivering with relief and sorrow. Us? She inquired. Yes, us. Your friends. You told her. I... I didn't think I had any of those, she said in nearly a whisper, half to you and half to herself. Of course you do! You said, raising your voice slightly and pulling her out of your embrace for a moment. You placed her hoofs on her shoulders, your eyes parallel, looking into one another in a connection that neither of you could fully explain. You're surrounded by ponies that care about you, and you'd see that if you just open... You paused. A beam of light fell across her face, divinely illuminating her amber eyes, each looking in completely opposite directions. You smiled. Your eyes, you finished. But, but they said... She began to speak uneasily. I know what they said. I read your note. You hesitated again, as if to wipe all the memory of that horrible past away. If they say those things, they're not your friends. You can't let ponies like that hurt you, you reassured her. They said they knew what was best for me, she uttered. Her voice trailed off, low and disheartened. They lied, Derby. They only cared about themselves. They couldn't accept that someone could be different and still beautiful. And you are. You are one of the most beautiful ponies I've ever known. And I don't just mean on the outside. If they can accept all the love and kindness you have to give to this world because of the way you are, well, they're missing out. In that moment, Derby's eyes lit up as if by some fire in the back of her mind. She threw her forelegs around you as tears of contentment flowed down her face and dropped and broke like glass on the floor in a bright rhythm. She held you like she held on to everything beautiful she longed for. You became the tangible manifestation. All the while, a smile of pure innocence and bliss like you'd never known or would ever know spread across her face. You returned her embrace as the best you could, but to try to emulate something so pure is an endeavor bound to fail. You poured your heart for her in that embrace, passing emotions to one another by contact alone. You letting her know that everything is okay, and she's simply saying, Thank you. After a moment, your eyes fell to a thin white wisp around Derby's neck. Upon closer inspection, it revealed itself to be a little string of twine, wrapped in a simple knot around her neck and hapelessly frayed at the end. You looked upward, wondering if the remaining segment could be near. Sure enough, there was another broken bed of twine wrapped around the blade of a large ceiling fan in the center of the room. Derby, did, 
Did you try to... She nodded. With this? She nodded again. You couldn't help but let out a small chuckle at how heartwarming, how endearing she was. <laughs> Let's go home, Derby, to your true friends, you said. But at this statement, she only held on to you harder, wordlessly begging for you to stay for just one more moment. So stay you did, for moments too numerous to count in a lifetime. As the rays of sun danced across the walls, you stayed there together as the world ceaselessly turned, content to remain safe and secure in the loving arms of a friend. That was Beautiful Hearts and Suicide Notes. It was written by Edgar Allan Poney. Now, I know a lot of you guys are probably thinking, Wow, Ice Gaze, you read fan fictions. Well, I'm actually kind of thinking about starting to do those a bit more often. Because I did do one back then, a while back during the summer. It was called Beloved and Admirers. And I recommend you go check that out. But um, I bet a lot of you guys are wondering why I would decide to do one now and why I would choose one that is so devastating. Well, unfortunately, yesterday um, I found out that one of my friends back from middle school committed suicide. And it was very sim similar to this case. Like, she was bullied or that's what people say no one really knows what happens some people are saying it's from bullying but honestly no one really knows and I just want to get kind of a message across that to anyone who is suffering from depression and also those who bully others because bullying is a serious problem and not everyone sees that like, some people are just like, oh, it was just a joke, oh, they'll get over it. And some people don't even care about those who are suicidal or who self-harm. Some people are like, oh, it's their right, it's their life, they have a decision to cut, they have a choice to self-harm. Not exactly. <laughs> That's not really how it works, because honestly, and I'm saying this from self-experience, for anyone who suffers from depression, those people are most likely to self-harm, and those people who suffer from depression, it's not fun, because <laughs> I've suffered from depression from such a a long time for such a long time for so many years and I know that's not something a lot of people would expect from me because you know I'm always I'm always sounding so happy and ditzy but I have been suffering from depression a few years so surprise and honestly for those who don't suffer from depression and who say oh they have a choice oh it's not that bad well from experience it's not fun it's really not it feels like there is just a, a rain cloud following you everywhere it feels like you're in chains and you have to haul them everywhere and they're just so heavy and it's just weighing you down it's not the best feeling in the world and my dog agrees if anyone heard that <laughs> anyway and um basically um, self-harming for people who suffer from depression is kind of like a reflex like it's not really controllable like it's not really a choice it just seems like a solution or like a way to cease the pain and it's not fun now to move on to those who um, do suffer from depression even though um, I still suffer from depression, I just want to put this out there because it always comes to mind, but I never seem to listen to it. I don't know why. I'm better at helping others than I am at helping myself. 
Anyway, I just want everyone to know who suffers from depression or who is suicidal or anything like that. There's always someone out there that you can talk to. There's always someone who loves you and who will listen. And honestly, you can go to a parent, a guidance counselor. They were teenagers too. They know all about bullying. And even if they didn't suffer from depression, they love you. And they're willing to listen. And if they're not willing to listen, go to a friend or a guidance counselor. Or if they're not willing to listen, honestly, you can come to me. Because I've, I've pretty much experienced so much of depression that I can pretty much relate to anything. So if no one you know's listen, or if you're too afraid to go to a friend or someone personal, you can always come to me. My Skype is down in the description because honestly, I don't want to see people suffer like I do because honestly, in my world, others come before myself. I'm not sure if that's the best way to put it or the best way to live, but that's just how I see it. I always put others before myself. Anyway, so, oh my gosh, I'm literally tearing up right now. <laughs> anyway, I hope you guys all enjoyed this fan fiction and i hope i brought a message across and i hope i kind of inspired you sort of to stop bullying or to you know seek help if you're feeling depressional depressional is that a word i don't know it is now anyway if you're suffering from depression or if you're suicidal or anything like that um there's always someone who's going to listen. Um, you can seek help. They have lines for that. They have websites for that. They have community groups for that. There's always someone out there. And if there's no one out there who you think loves you, I love you. And I there's probably going to be hundreds, maybe thousands of people listening to this right now. And... I'm probably not going to know them, but I don't need to know you to love you because most of my YouTube friends, I don't know them personally, but I love all of them and I love all of you too. So I'm going to stop the recording here because I think I've been talking about like for 10 minutes now, <laughs> but you know, I've just kind of been talking from my heart. So um, that's about it. And don't forget you can always come talk to me if my Skype's in the description. And once again, I love you, even if you think no one else does.